Welcome to the Impact Nations podcast, episode 71, The Book of Mystery. Did Paul actually write the book of Ephesians? Was it really written to the church in Ephesus? And do we even know what the word mystery means? All of that and lots more as we begin our study of the book of Ephesians. Hello, everyone. Delighted to be coming back together again. Uh, we're beginning season seven. We're going to take a, a multi-week journey through the book of Ephesians. You know, it's, it's many years since I have taught uh, systematically through Ephesians. And now that we're going into this series, I have been really sincerely quite excited, really looking forward uh, with a sense of, of anticipation. You know, along with Romans, in Ephesians, Paul develops his core doctrinal convictions. It's Romans and Ephesians that are the two most theological letters. Um, Paul addresses the Trinity, the nature of salvation, uh, the universal church. In this wonderful letter, Paul talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ, which has been a phrase that's been like a theme resonating in me for more than 10 years. Um, Christostom, one of the church fathers, he wrote that Ephesians is full of Paul's most sublime thoughts that he scarcely utters anywhere else. Uh, Origen, another church father, said this, Paul heaped up more obscure ideas and mysteries unknown to the ages, isn't that interesting, in this epistle than in all the others. In fact, Origen ranked Ephesians as the pinnacle of Paul's letters. He said it contains solid food. It contains deep and mystical understanding. In our contemporary times, a, a 20th century theologian that I like very much, C.H. Dodd, he said that Ephesians thought is the very crown of Paulinism. You know, it's only 2,500 words. It's six chapters. Yet, yet Paul will take us on a journey that starts from the beginning of time. Right at the beginning, he talks about before the foundation of the world. And he takes us all the way through to the very end of time where he talks about the summing up of all things in heaven and on earth. Paul uses the word mystery more than in any other book in the entire Bible. Paul invites us into the invisible realm. He calls it the heavenly realm. And we're going to look at that in several times because he comes back to that again and again. Paul makes us aware of, of both the angelic eternal realm and the reality of the dark spiritual powers that are constantly in opposition against us. Paul writes to the church about her true identity as the fullness of Christ, his bride. And he, and he says, we're like a building made up of living stones. Ephesians 2, 21-22, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. He's talking about also the body of Christ in terms of the mystical body of Christ. Ephesians 5, 23, Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. Now we know that Paul was a, an unparalleled a planter and builder, a teacher, a communicator, but he was also, just like the Apostle John, a mystic. And I want us to remember this through this series. We must not overlook this reality that Paul was a mystic because to do so is to miss much of what he's addressing. To use or Origen's word, pinnacle, to overlook the mysticism of Paul would be like looking at a mountain when the top is covered with cloud and saying, we've seen it all. <clears throat> In the second half of the letter, Paul, who was both the mystic and the apostolic practitioner, he lays out what is probably the best summary of Christian life uh, in the context of community that we find in the entire New Testament. 
because for Paul, spiritual realities are reflected on how we live here on earth. He's always tangible, and we have to be with him because otherwise we slip into Gnosticism. We run after otherworldly experiences. We, we're looking to experience rather than to Christ. And Gnosticism from the very beginning has always led to a spiritual elitism and exclusiveness. Whenever you hear the sound of this anywhere in our day, that, that we have a higher revelation or God's shown us new truths that are, that, are, that are higher, more lofty, I tell you, your antenna needs to be up because that that's Gnosticism, and one of the ways you recognize it is there's no practical uh, working out of discipleship. Paul never falls off one side or the other. You know, I was reading an Orthodox theologian recently, and he said this about Ephesians, and I, I love the way he said it. It is in no way a formal treatise or a discourse but rather a spontaneous, <clears throat> exultant, Eucharistic hymn about the blessings of Christ's church. We do not say these things lightly. The reader must approach this divine book very seriously and devoutly if he is to hear what God has to say to him. So in beginning to explore the mysteries announced in the epistle to the Ephesians, the reader must adopt the humble posture described by St. Paul in a 14th verse of the third chapter, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? So it's time now. Let's begin this journey with Paul and see where it takes us in the coming weeks. Today is an introduction. Today I'm trying to, to lay a foundation uh, of context, of, of history, so that we understand, we, we have that as a grid by which to look through each of the passages we're going to cover. And the best way to gain an understanding of Paul's writing is to look at the environment to which he wrote, the issues that the Ephesians are dealing with, Context is always vital for understanding. So we're going to take some time today to examine some of these key issues. The first is under the heading of authorship. You see, over the last just over 200 years, there's been significant debate about who actually wrote the letter. Uh, more debate on Ephesians than any other of Paul's letters. And this doubt was was first introduced actually in 1792 and it opened a door and so there's still division among scholars. Some say Paul wrote it, some say no, somebody else did. And, and the debate focuses on a bunch of things but here's the three main ones. One is that in Ephesians there's a significant number of unique phrases. For example, what I referenced a minute ago, in the heavenly places or in the heavenly realm. That's unique. So they say, well, that isn't like the other letters of Paul. But if you take a close look at Paul's letters, you'll find that each of them is filled with many unique phrases. I was reading a commentator, uh, Cadbury his name is, who, uh, who said this. And I like the way he thought. He said, which is more likely that an imitator of Paul in the first century composed a writing that was 90 or 95 percent in accordance with Paul's style, or that Paul himself wrote a letter diverging five or six percent from his usual style. I think obviously the second is much more likely. I'm someone who has to do a fair amount of writing and correspondence and, and writing articles, and, and there's overarching themes that come out of me, but, but there, it's written in some different ways. So I think Cadbury's position makes the most sense. The second issue is um, that in Ephesians, Paul is never speaking to specific situations, but, but in a general sense. He, he's never really addressing the issues of a local congregation. Thirdly, those who, who think that Paul did not write Ephesians, by the way, they think that, that a later follower of his, a later disciple of his school of thinking. But for those, they see 
Ephesians as the, the first interpretation and guide to Paul's teaching after he died, which was, we know, in Rome in 65 or 66. Now, this is hotly debated, but as I've read a lot on this, this uh, last several months, the majority view is that Paul did write the letter. And, and when I read the evidence on both sides, I've come to that conclusion. I, I think it's Paul who wrote Ephesians. You know, one of the strongest reasons uh, is the unanimous acceptance of Paul's authorship among the early church fathers, the ones who lived closest to Paul's time. Clement of Rome, who was first century, he said it was Paul. Ignatius, uh, who was a, a disciple of John, and he he lived in the, in the first century and into the early second century. Polycarp, also early, early, a contemporary uh, of Ignatius. Irenaeus, Tertullian, they all said this was Paul's writing. And by the way, Ephesians was the first book to be called Scripture by the early fathers. Now, uh, the doubters questioned that impersonal character uh, of the letter, that it was general. And they focused largely on chapter 115, we'll see that in a couple of weeks, where he said, I, I have heard of your faith. But as we'll see in a minute, Paul has been away from Ephesus, primarily in prison, for six or seven years. And so, of course, as he wrote them all these years later, he knew that there would now be many new believers in Ephesus that he had never met. So let's look at the second issue, the destination. Where did this letter go? Well, we say, well, to, to Ephesus, right? But <laughs> there's a reason for the debate on this. In the mid-1800s, there were five manuscripts that were found uh, that were missing the phrase, in Ephesus, when Paul said, I'm writing to the disciples, to the church in Ephesus. Now, <clears throat> Some believe that Paul sent Tychicus with multiple copies of a general letter and left space in it to fill in the name of the specific church. But you know, there's multiple evidence to support that really the, the authentic version does say in Ephesus. You know, in all other manuscripts, both in the East and in the West, there it is. It's included in all variations of the letter. Now, you know that there's variations of the letters because they didn't have photocopiers. And so one scribe would pass it to another, who'd pass it to another, who'd pass it to another, and that's how things got multiplied. And so sometimes there were slight variations. Never was there a variation on the issue of who it was sent to. When Ignatius wrote his letter to the Ephesians, which, by the way, is marvelous, he wrote that in 108, so one generation later, but when he wrote it, he used many expressions and quotes from Paul's letter. Now, it may have been possible that a later scribe, manuscripts that, we, that come up a long time, maybe even a couple of hundred years later, may have omitted in Ephesus in order to make the, the manuscript more relevant to his own church. Regardless, I think this is the most likely solution. I think this letter was meant as a circular letter that was sent first to the mother church, which is uh, Ephesians, or Ephesus. And it was, it was sent there uh, with the idea that it would then be passed on out to the surrounding church plants. Here's the third heading, and that's date. Now, for those who believe that Ephesians was written by a follower of, of a disciple of Paul or the Pauline school, uh, they believe it was written in the 80s, and yet they acknowledge this is impossible to prove. Uh, this is just uh, based on the assumption that the letter was written uh, as a pseudonym with Paul. It was written to confirm his influence in teaching to now a new generation. However, if Paul did write Ephesus, and I've already said I believe he did, it's been suggested two different dates. One is in the mid-50s, 
And uh, the other is a much later date, 62 or 63. Now, why on earth does this matter? Because it's important to know the circumstances under which Paul wrote the letter. Was he writing to a church that he had just visited? Or was he writing to one that he had not seen in in years, probably seven years, and had no idea if he would ever see again. You would write very differently in those two circumstances. <coughs> Excuse me. So, for those who are interested, based on the book of Acts, I'm going to give you a timeline, the timeline that I'm most comfortable with. In AD 52 to 55, Paul goes to the city of Ephesus and he shares the gospel. And, and that's written about in Acts 19. But then there's an uprising, and so he has to leave quickly. So he goes to Macedonia, Acts chapter 20, verse 1. So that's 52 to 55. In 57, Paul meets briefly with the, uh, the leaders, the elders of Ephesus, while he's in another city called Troas, and he's there on his way to Jerusalem. He, he's going to be close enough to them that they arrange a rendezvous. That's in 57. From 57 to 59, we know that Paul is held in custody in first in Jerusalem and then in Caesarea. In 60 to 62 or 3, <coughs> excuse me, again we know that Paul is imprisoned in Rome. And the vast majority of scholars believe that Paul wrote Ephesus during that time while he was in a Roman prison. So all of this points to a later date. Well, why does it matter? Besides what I said a minute ago about he's writing to people that he, he, he probably knows he's never going to see again. It also means he's writing out of a place of six or seven years of imprisonment it reflects years of prayer, of meditation. It also, that's positively, negatively, it, it reflects years of separation and the invariable, in, invariable uh, uncertainty that comes. And, and he's relying on whatever bit of news he can get. So it's a long time since he's seen these believers. The fourth issue, and this one is really, really big. And that is the setting of Ephesus. I said to you earlier, understanding the environment is vital for a proper reading of this letter. Paul is addressing some really big overarching issues that affected every aspect of life for all people, including believers, in first century Roman Empire. Now, Ephesus was really a big deal. It was a big deal big, important city. I, I was thinking about it earlier. I thought in some ways it's like New York City. Um, Ephesus was called the, the mother of Asia. It was the most influential city in Asia, culturally, politically, economically. It was the leading city and provincial capital of the richest region in all of the Roman Empire. It was extremely cosmopolitan. It was multi-ethnic. They estimate there were 200 to 250,000 people living in Ephesus, which was huge for antiquity. In fact, its population was only behind Rome itself and Athens. It was the largest trading center in the Roman world. It was connected by key shipping routes to Syria, Egypt, Italy, Greece, even the what's called the Royal Road, which was built by King Darius of Persia in the 6th century BC. Why is this important? Because Paul selected always strategic cities, Corinth is a good example, where the gospel would spread naturally along these trade routes to surrounding communities. So you see, Paul, who is our, a mystic, is also incredibly practical and wise. Well, let's talk a little more about the environment. The religious environment is this, um, that we have to understand that, that the early Christians found themselves in, a, in a, almost like a pressure cooker, almost a precarious environment. 
Uh, and it gives us a much clearer perspective on why Paul was emphasizing what he did in this letter. There were three great forces pressing against the church. The first one was Artemis. Now, some of your Bibles, a minority of your Bibles, would translate that as Diana. She's the same goddess. The veneration of the goddess Artemis was at the center of life for the Ephesians. The temple of Artemis was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It was four times bigger than the Parthenon in Athens. If any of you, like me, have seen the Parthenon, to imagine it was four times bigger, did you know that the temple of Artemis in, Eph in Ephesus was the largest building in all of antiquity? It was 225 by 425 feet. It had 127 columns. Each of them were 60 feet high. These are massive dimensions for back then. And all of life revolved around the Temple of Artemis. If we can imagine, twice every week in Ephesus, there was a, a procession held in her honor. Every week, twice. And, and in it, various statues of her were paraded from the temple through the entire city. The, the influence of Artemis, this, it's a cult, uh, permeated every aspect of life. Now we know from Luke's account in Acts that many, many Ephesians became followers of Christ. And this started to change the fabric of the city, and it created a shakeup because it affected the very lucrative sales of silver statues to Artemis that were a major factor among the merchant class. I mean, people, the followers of Artemis, they came from all over the empire. And, and now, all of a sudden, that's starting to shift. We read in Acts 19 that a great mob uprising took place in response to the merchant's outcry. This was a big deal. Now, connected with the Artemis cult was magic. That was a big part of it. Uh, ancient sources tell us that Ephesus was perhaps the most open city in the empire to magicians and to sorcerers, and ironically, some historians of the time say, and to fakes. It was likely the center for the study of magic. You're going to see how these things matter so much over the next few weeks. In response to the gospel spreading in, in Ephesus, something started to shift. And we hear from Luke about the people coming one day and they burned all their sorcery books and their items. He, Luke tells us it was uh, worth more than 50,000 days of wages. Just do the math to imagine how huge that is. So many who had engaged in magic and sorcery, and, and some of them had even earned their livelihood from it, they had now become part of the church. In this environment, it's likely that magic and superstition still had some reasonable pull on these new believers. You see, the Ephesians had a strong awareness of the presence and the influence of both good and evil spirits. And this helps us to understand Paul's emphasis on, on evil spirits and powers and principalities. Ephesians 2.2, 2, you once walked following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air. We're going to look at that in a few weeks. The spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. On the famous verse, 6.12, for our struggle is not against blood, uh, blood and flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly place. Paul talks a lot about that, and now we know why. The second big influence besides the Artemis cult was the imperial cult. Rome dominated life throughout the empire. Because of its great military and political power, it was like this huge, irresistible influence on the lives of every Roman citizen in the Mediterranean world. And because you become a believer, that influence doesn't go away. We're surrounded by it. You know, in the time of Augustus, 
Caesars began to be worshipped as divine. This imperial cult flowed into civic life. Uh, it, it became, there was worship, worship uh, of the emperor and worship of his family. Throughout the Roman Empire, cities started to have their own imperial temples, religious temples. They were filled with images and statues of Augustus. Did you know that even time was restructured to revolve around the birth of Augustus? It, the calendar was centered on his birthday. And the new calendar spoke of Augustus as Savior and God. Isn't that interesting? The day of his birth was proclaimed as the beginning of good tidings to the earth. So Christians were faced with constant conflict between the gospel of Christ and the gospel proclaimed on the coins and the statues and the images that were all around them. The third influence was Judaism. The Jewish population in Ephesians, in Ephesus, was 10 to 20,000. And we know that Paul began by going to the Jews and teaching in the synagogue. Uh, a few years ago, Christina and I had the wonderful experience of spending a day in Ephesus and, and uh, got pictures of the, of the synagogue, the very synagogue where, where he was. <clears throat> by the way, by the second century, it had become a library. But the Jews, they, they rejected the gospel. Here's Luke's account of it. Uh, in Acts 19, then Paul went to the synagogue, preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now, remember, he was there for perhaps three years. If, as we look closely at Paul's letter, we're going to see indications of tension between not only the Jews and, uh, and the Gentiles, but Jewish and Gentile believers. And this was true uh, with the Galatians and the Romans, but we're going to see that. So it's vital to read Ephesians with an awareness that the believers to whom Paul was writing lived within the context and the constant pressure of pagan religion, the imperial cult, and Judaism. That was the background of their, of their lives. Okay, so that's giving you a little bit of a historical background. And I hope that's going to really help for this letter to come alive as we refer to that foundation. Let's talk a little bit about how Paul structured this letter. He divided Ephesians quite evenly into two sections. Theology, first three chapters, and ethics, chapter 4, 5, 6. I'll talk about theology in a few minutes. But the, So we'll go first to ethics. The second half is about putting into practice the implications of the first half. And uh, I won't take a lot of time on this because we're going to develop it more fully. But, but look for some key words. Walk. That's a word Paul uses a lot, which means the way you live your life. And he says, walk in unity, walk in love, walk in holiness, walk in the light, walk in wisdom. The second thing we see is love. He uses the word 20 times in this rather short letter. It's a, pro a prominent theme in both the first and second section. He talks about the Holy Spirit, thirdly. He says that the Holy Spirit is the seal of our inheritance. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us access to the Father. It's the Holy Spirit who dwells in what he calls the new temple of believers. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals the mystery of Gentiles and Jews as one body. It's the Holy Spirit who brings unity, who grieves its sin, who fills believers, he says the Holy Spirit is even like a sword and it empowers our prayer. Another key word is body. He says the church is Christ's body. He says Jews and Gentiles are reconciled into one body. We'll get to this later, but we read it and go, yeah, yeah. It was incredibly shocking in that world. Shocking, but he said absolutely. 
He's brought, been brought into unity in one body. He says that there's, there's five-fold offices or gifts, apostle, uh, prophet, etc., that are given for the building up of what? The body. He talks about community relationships. He deals directly with, with marriage, with parent and child issues, with master and servant for us, employer and employee. Again, he's practical. But in the midst of it, he talks throughout about mystery. The Greek word is mysterion. And he uses it seven times in this letter. Now, in a modern sense, a mystery is, is something that needs to be solved. I, I'm somebody who enjoys mysteries. But for the early church, very different meaning. Mystery refers to God's revelation to us of something that we could not possibly know unless he made it known. This is what we mean by, by revelation. This is mystery. Now, in Ephesians, we're going to watch and see how Paul uses mystery progressively. He first introduces it with the union of earth and heaven in Christ. And then the, the mysterious and surprising union of Jews and Gentiles. And finally, the union of Christ with his church, which is, is been called the mystical body. This is called the great mystery. Okay, that's structure. Let's look a little bit at style. We're doing a lot today, but stay with me. We're on the home stretch. Bishop Yosef has written something that I absolutely loved. So I'm going to read it to you in its entirety. The thoughts in this epistle can barely be fit into human words. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Indeed, but there is the feeling that the apostle wishes he could say more. There's an energetic tension in the wording. The expressions rise and fall. <clears throat> Excuse me. They move forward and back. They repeat. They emphasize. They develop and rush along like a strong, foaming current. And all the while, the Holy Spirit carries us up with him to dizzying heights of divinity. That's very much what is going on, certainly for me, in, in reading and, and being pretty immersed in Ephesians for the last several months. This letter, style-wise, is marked by extremely long sentences. The, the sentences in the Greek are so long that modern translators, uh, no matter what translation you have, they always break them up, you know, with... with periods and with semicolons. But because of this, there's a number of grammatical kind of ambiguities, and they've led to some very significant differences of interpretation among scholars. We're going to get to that too, but I want you to know why. It's because these, these sentences, the longest in the New Testament, are, are complicated. Now, the style of this letter differs from most of Paul's other letters. They're missing what the others have, which is like fast-paced. He's dealing with issues. They're often polemic, which really means argumentative almost in tone. We've talked a lot about rhetoric in, in previous seasons. But unlike most of the others, Ephesians is not written in response to a specific crisis or conflict in the church. Now, it's true there is a, an energetic tension, but it's, it's like pent up. Tension. You'll see it in the wording as we go through this. The tension of Paul, he wants to say more, to even find other ways to communicate the depth of his revelation. Uh, it, it, it's a more contemplative letter than his others, especially the first half. It, it's got a more reflective mood and, and a more liturgical style of writing. Uh, classic example, we're going to look at two well-known and so important um, prayers, one in chapter 1 and one in chapter 3. They're, they're hymn-like. And as I said, it's more of a general letter. We don't see any specific greetings or thanks or, or, or talking of, you know, don't forget Fred. Remember, I told you before, this is a circular letter. Now let's look at the purpose and theme. We'll take another look at what's going on in the church. 
As always, the circumstances, as I said, help us to understand the context. It appears that the Ephesian church was likely organized into house churches. Uh, that's clear from Acts 20:20. 20, 20, but Paul taught them from house to house. He did that. That's the way he did things. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, where he talks about the church that meets in Priscilla and Aquila's house. That when Christina and I were in Ephesus, we were amazed because in the wealthier part of town, the houses in that part of the city were over 10,000 square feet. Um, I think that there's a picture going up for you to see just one example. Now, the fact that there were house churches, that that's the way it seemed to have been structured, naturally led to diversity. And therefore, there was a need for fatherly direction. You know, it's always a challenge when you're leading and pastoring, whether it's a church or it's now it's like this impact family. You, you don't want to hinder people. You don't want to put them in a harness, but you don't want to lose your values. You don't want to lose the direction of where you're going. And so I, I really relate to this personally, but this is what Paul had to do in this letter. Secondly, while he's in the prison in Rome, he heard that the Ephesian believers were disheartened. Imagine if you were in prison for six or seven years and rarely do you get news and what you get is, oh, they're discouraged. And that's why I think he wrote, in chapter 3, verse 13, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. See, Paul knew because of this atmosphere we talked about, he knew that there was a, a pervasive negative spiritual environment and uh, that tempts the believers to turn back. He's saying, don't do it. Don't do it. And this is why he responds to them by reminding them of three things. He reminds them about the power and the grace of God. He reminds them of their role as the church in God's great plan to unite the entire cosmos under Christ. These are big concepts. I, I can hardly wait for us to dig into them. And thirdly, he reminds them of their ethical responsibility that God's grace and calling has placed upon them. <clears throat> Here's another purpose and theme, spiritual power, both good and evil. More than any other letter, Paul addresses the issue of God's power over the principalities and powers. The church feels threatened by the spiritual powers that shape the outside world. These powers are inseparably linked to the evil that believers are witnessing every day in their lives. Paul is telling the church that God's power is available to all believers and therefore they don't need any additional pagan or magical or spiritual protection. Remember that influences all around them. And it's all of their neighbors rely on it. All of their co-workers, probably many of their family members, be saying, you don't need to do that. Paul's, God's power enables them to resist Satan, one, and number two, his power empowers them to love one another. Paul instructs them on how to deal with the principalities and powers. He finishes the letter in a very specific way on this. So we'll talk more, and I've mentioned it in the past, but we need to understand that the, the powers that be, the principalities and powers, are, are what is operating behind the political and the civic and the religious systems of his day and also of ours. Fourthly, the Jewish and Gentile followers of Christ are now united in one spiritual body. Therefore, unity is a major theme in this letter. Uh, by the way, this was interesting. Ephesians is the only place in all the New Testament where the word unity is used. And, and he expresses oneness and unity, and we'll see more later. Lots of examples of that. But that because we're in Christ, we're one in Christ. He says that 38 times. Um, <clears throat> he says that, and you who were included in Christ, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked with, uh, in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. He notice, notice these inclusive words, which he uses 14 times in the letters. With, together, unity, 
um, in the church. We're really on the home stretch now. I want to give you a quick overview of the theology of this letter because the, uh, Ephesians summarizes most of Paul's most prominent theological themes. Number one is the Trinity. Ephesians has been called the Trinitarian letter. The activity of the Trinity is found in eight different passages in this letter. Paul's, Paul's letter is surely one of the most profoundly doctrinal and yet, as I said, intensely practical books of the Bible. And therefore, it's not surprising that the doctrine of the triune God, the Trinity, breaks into his uh, message so frequently. Uh, here's an example, Ephesians 2.18. For through Christ, we both have access by one spirit into the Father. How Trinitarian is that? He, he teaches us that the Trinity is the basis of our spiritual blessing. First of all, because of the Father. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, because of the Son and his sacrifice. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood. And because of the seal of the Holy Spirit, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Through the work of Christ, we are united in one spirit and we have access to the Father. So, let's just say just a few more things about the Father. Because this I've been thinking about the last few days. First of all, the most of any of Paul's letters uh, eight times Paul talks about the Father, the Father of glory, the Father of Christ, the Father of all revelation. And here's what I've been thinking about. The Father from whom every family in heaven and earth originates. I'm telling you the heart of the Father is an inclusive heart. And Paul is, is going after ethnocentricity. Do you know what that word means? The, the, the ethnics the uh, ethnicity becomes the central grid through which we measure how right or wrong other people are. He's going right after that in this letter, and I want to challenge us to go after that. Father is inclusive. He is above all. He's through all. He's blessed. He's chosen. He's established destiny. He's adopted us. A second, Christ. Christ is mentioned, are you ready for this, 26 times in this letter. Um, and he talks about Christ rather than Jesus almost all the time. What's he doing? He is reminding them of the eternal, infinite Christ, a bigger Jesus. Um, he affirms in chapter 4 that, that he is the Son of God, that he is beloved, which by the way was a messianic title that he became flesh, that he died on the cross, that he was raised from the dead, that all creation is under his feet. Christ is the eternal, divine, cosmic head of all, the head of the church. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit. Fourteen times, more than any other letter except Galatians, he talks about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reveals the person of God. He's the means of our revelation. He seals believers until the day of redemption. He fills believers with power. The Holy Spirit is the means by which believers are filled with God's fullness. Um, he talks about salvation. Besides the Trinity, the, the second big theological theme is salvation. Uh, soteriology is the official word, but it means the doctrine of salvation. For, for Paul in, in Ephesians, salvation is initiated in the past at the cross. But our salvation is presently being worked out, and this includes sanctification. And finally, our salvation will be consummated in the future. He sees salvation as rescue from our former state. And he concentrates directly on God's gift of salvation. The third theological theme is ecclesiology. Again, a big word that means the church. Perhaps more than any other letter of Paul. He focuses on the identity of the church. This, we're going to get into this, and it just becomes very thrilling, actually, when we get hold of it. 
as I told you before, in his other letters, he's addressing specific issues, but here he's mainly, mainly speaking about the universal church, not the local church. He calls it a living organism that, that exists only because of what God has accomplished through Christ. And he uses the metaphors we're familiar with, body, a holy temple, a new humanity, a family, a bride. All those come out in Ephesians. Um, for Paul, the church is not an organization. It is a living, growing, dynamic organism. I think we've got to catch hold of that and the implications of that for our corporate life together. He's saying the church is a whole new entity. It's a whole new kind of community where identity is established both in the heavenly realm and here on earth. God has both res uh, rescued and empowered the church for what? More than anything, to love to comprehend his love, he says in chapter 3, and to love one another. And so, we're about to begin what I think will be a remarkable journey. It is certainly being one for me. Ephesians is unique. It is so broad. Its themes are, are huge, both from before the beginning of time to the end of time, the heavenlies here on earth, but it's still, though it's broad, it's deep deep in insight. Ephesians has been called the book of mystery. It's been called the book of the Trinity. It calls us both upward to the heavenly realm and lays out what this heavenly identity must mean for the Ephesians in the most practical of terms. It's Paul's most universal letter. It describes a church that transcends ethnic and social boundaries. Boy, don't we need that now. It breaks down the barrier between Jews and, and many Gentile cultures. Rather than being about an individual church, it's the universal church, and he's laying out its identity as the, as the true body of Christ, not only on the earth, but there's this mystical side to it. So this is where we're going today. I, I've shared a lot today, I understand, but I'm very excited and I really felt like we needed to lay a broad foundation. Let me finish by praying. Lord, as I saw that it's like Paul, the words are tumbling out of him sometimes. And there is repetition and there's, there's layered adjectives upon adjectives and trying to find words. Lord, I related so much to that because even as I'm preparing this season, I'm trying to find words for how, how high and how deep and how long and how wide is the love of Christ. Lord, would you please help all of us? We need revelation because mystery isn't something that we got to solve. It's something that you reveal and release to us. So we say, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, let it be upon us through this series. We just love you and we ask your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Now what? The gospel is meant to be lived. We now invite you to be a part of the discussion as we talk about how to apply this teaching. YouTube viewers can use the comment section below. You can also email your questions and comments to podcast at impactnations.com. I am excited about Ephesians. I've been looking forward to this for a while, so I'm really, really glad we got started today. Um, that was an excellent overview. Uh, Thanks. I'm, yeah, I've, I've got a couple questions, but you gave us lots to think about. I think that's mostly just getting started today. Um, hey, just before we jump into those questions, last week I was talking about monthly giving champions yeah. and what heroes they are, and I know many of our listeners are, are monthly givers to Impact Nations. Um, and I, I just wanted to remind people, if you're listening to this uh, and maybe you've been thinking about, oh, yeah, I should, I should do that, like hit pause, go do it right now. Uh, you, will, uh, you will be participating in kingdom activity. You will be participating in radically changing lives. As a monthly giver, every single month, your dollars will be going to bring rescue to the desperate, to the hungry, to the needy, uh, to those who have no hope. Uh, you will be 
you'll be bringing rescue to teenage girls who have been abused and abandoned and uh, think that they have no hope and are about to find out that indeed they have a great deal of hope and everything's about to change. You will be bringing rescue to those kids who right now are making bricks in a brick factory uh, and um, because of your gift could leave that brick factory forever and in instead actually have a whole new future uh, for their entire family. Uh, you will be bringing the gospel to communities that have perhaps never even heard the name of Jesus. Uh, with your monthly gift, you every single month will be making a difference in lives all over the world. You will be participating with people from all over the globe. The Impact Nations family uh, is quite an extraordinary community. It really uh, is. That is just uh, so sold out for seeing the gospel of Jesus Christ come and change everything. Uh, and so we we want to invite you to come and, and do that. You, you got anything you want to say on that? Well, I, I, I just would like to say that... Um, our world keeps growing and growing. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to make it grow. Yeah. God just opens doors yeah. and there's a need. And, and you know, we've we talked about it in the First John series. That, yeah. that you can't just say, well, you know, God bless you. Let me pray for you. Yeah. Um, and, and there's been incredible fruitfulness. But it keeps opening up and opening up yeah. and opening up to this week, a new community, new area in Malawi. Um, it, 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 you're going to scout in another nation, but it's it's we're not like looking for things. Oh, what can we do now? Yeah. It's God just puts it in front of us. Indeed. And and so with that, frankly, we we need more and more and more of us. Yeah. And it's not that one person needs to give a massive amount. It's it's as this as a family as we all do something. Yeah. Um, uh, that the the fruit is is remarkable indeed so uh, I'm, that's my encouragement because you know if i was realistic i mean let's uh, you last week you said for example if if 200 people gave 50 dollars a month and we have a lot more than 200 people listening to this um that's ten thousand dollars what we can do with ten thousand sure. dollars on the front lines is yeah, huge absolutely and frankly i i can't take uh my wife out coincidentally your mother i i can't take her out for just like a simple modest i uh, just want to go out for supper tonight uh not a big date yeah for 50 bucks yeah yeah and for 50 dollars, for instance I, we could uh we could purchase seeds that will go into the ground uh in a garden somewhere and will become food that will keep keep producing year after year after year. Every we we're harvesting every three to four months in nations like Uganda and Malawi. Uh, and actually, when we harvest, we replant seeds directly. Those are those are mm -hmm. uh, non-GMO seeds that can be replanted. Uh, and so, I mean, if you want to just talk about buying a meal that you can't even get for fifty bucks, uh, we can take that fifty dollars and turn it into perpetual meals that just keep on feeding Thousands. communities over and over and yeah. over again. Yeah, it's true. So this is. This is our almsgiving, yeah. is what it is. Yeah. And, uh, and that's one of the marks of a disciple. Mm. said, when you give alms, not yeah. if you give. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So uh, when you sign up for monthly giving, you probably want to do that at impactnations.com slash monthly. Uh, you can read there again what it means to be a monthly giving champion. Um, you're entering into a, a whole new community by doing that, uh, and you're helping us get the job done. So impactnations.com slash monthly. I'd encourage you to just hit pause. We'll be, we'll be here when you get back uh, and uh, sign up for that right now. And we do appreciate the giving. Absolutely. And, and people give in so many yeah. ways. And, and for those who are giving uh, regularly, we just thank you so much for being a part of this family it is extraordinary we see you we love you guys and uh we're just it's such a joy to partner with you to bring the kingdom of god to these communities yeah. uh all right uh the book of ephesians um i think i'd like to actually start and this may be a difficult question i don't know i don't know if you've given some thought to this but i want to start with a really broad question which is uh as as you're entering into this series uh, we're going to see different themes developed, and you, you talked about some of those today. But um, I think that a lot of our listeners are probably going to be approaching this book uh, each week with you, but also on their own and, and, and stuff. What's the one thing that you want people to have top of mind as they're, as they're reading Ephesians, as they just sit down and crack open this letter? Mm -hmm. What's the one thing, no matter where in the book they, they arrive, that you feel like really just needs to be top of mind as they're contemplating this scripture? Wow, that's great. You're right. I have not thought of that. 
Um, I know that, and it's somewhat thematic for me the last few years, but I, I, I know that this book of mystery, I'd like them to begin, <laughs> to quote Jesus in John 4, lift up your eyes and see. Mm -hmm. Begin to understand the heavenly realm, and I'm going to talk more about this in the next week or two. Heavenly realm is not meant to be esoteric. As I said, we don't want to slip into Gnosticism where we're mm -hmm. looking for these you know, out-of-body experiences. The, the heavenly realm, um, and I was chatting with a friend about this the other day, is, is I think best understood in the C.S. Lewis quote, the way further up is further in. Mm. And I hope that this will take us deeper um, and, and uh, into Christ yeah. and understanding what it means, beginning to understand what it means that, that Paul calls us the fullness of Christ, you yeah. know? Who fills all in all? I mean, woo. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Paul. Uh, I didn't actually know that there was any anybody out there questioning whether or not Paul had written that. That was news to me. Why do you think it's important that we settle in our minds that yeah, this was a letter from Paul? Because I think that uh, when that's settled, we begin to hear the heart of Paul in the larger context of all the collection of his letters that we have. We begin to understand the passion and the, the situation he's in, that it isn't, um, you know, a doctrinal treatise or something yeah. that, that those who say he didn't write it, and again, I want to emphasize the vast majority say he did. Yeah. Um, that... That yeah, that the authenticity of Paul's heart coming through. Yeah, very good. Um, I'm curious. Do you have a favorite passage? Is is there one one week you're really looking forward to? <laughs> well, I think my favorite chapters are one through six. <laughs> <laughs> Way to narrow it down. <laughs> I, I would I would I'm really looking forward to the longest sentence in the New Testament. It's so long it's going to take me portions of two weeks. Yeah. Uh, which is chapter 1 and uh, uh, 3 to 14. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm also really looking forward to those two wonderful um, hymn-like prayers of chapter 1 and chapter 3. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, really excited about this. As I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to this journey. Uh, you got a guess as to how many weeks we'll be settled in here we will definitely finish when we get to the end <laughs> perfect <laughs> uh, i i'm trying to tell how long it will be i usually underestimate because mm -hmm. we tend to go deeper yeah. um but i'm trying to balance it too i don't want to turn this into a one year you know right. verse by verse i'm not exactly sure we're going to bring in a couple of our friends yeah uh we've got a a new friend theologian yeah. going to be joining us going to be joining us in a few weeks so um I would think we'd come in at about 16 weeks, including mm -hmm. our guests. Yeah. Well, uh, there you have it, folks. We are going deep, and I'm very excited. Uh, I would encourage you just start uh, start reading Ephesians in the weeks to come, uh, in the days to come, and, and just seek the Lord and ask, ask him what he would reveal to you. Uh, if the Lord's been speaking to you through Ephesians or through this podcast, we would love to hear from you at uh, podcast at impactnations.com. Uh, you can write to us, and we'll read that for sure. We may get back to you, and we may ask your question here on the air as well. We are here every Thursday. Uh, we publish on uh, on YouTube uh, or on our website at impactnations.com slash podcast. You can listen there uh, or just subscribe uh, on your favorite podcast app and that'll get delivered directly to your device so you can listen on your way to work or what have you. Thanks so much. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>